Everybody. Welcome to the Snap No Tap podcast, and I want to wish everybody a uh, happy Easter, and uh, I hope everybody's life is going well. How are you doing, Mr. Cardinale? I'm doing good. Happy Easter, Tony. Um, happy Easter. I had a good, uh, a cool thing I checked out yesterday. I went to uh, up in uh, Libertyville. They've got a small museum there. I guess their park district does, uh, the Dunn Museum. But anyways, they have an art exhibit by this really great uh, comic book artist, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz. So uh, it's really cheap. I think it was 10 bucks to get into the entire museum and it included all the exhibits. But I went up there with Ben. The guy is a fantastic artist. He really revolutionized uh, comic books and elevated it. Uh, he's really a fine artist, honestly. And uh, the stuff was beautiful. So I was, had a really great Saturday checking that stuff out. Um, so any, any nerds in the area, the Chicagoland area, I highly recommend. Uh, it's worth the afternoon to go check it out. It's it's super cheap, and uh, yeah, you, you, seeing the, his his artwork uh, firsthand, it, it just gives you a whole level of appreciation. It's really cool. So that was nice. Yeah, and it was only you said ten dollars. So I mean, how do you uh, you can't beat that, you know? Because uh, you used to spend more than that at the, at the adult peep shows, right? Oh, they paid me more than that when I worked there. Oh, you said well, you were there, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. My shifts, I would pull a lot more than that. Way, way above minimum average, minimum gotcha. wage for my uh, <laughs> my time in the box. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, although I have some uh, less nice news, I, I, I think, I don't know if I mentioned on the podcast uh, or I talked to you personally, but I had an acquaintance who was assaulted. Um, just someone I know. I don't want to yeah. give too many details, uh, but I found out more about the incident. And I guess I'm bringing it up just as kind of a, a uh, you know a somber reminder of what we're up against and why we we train and what we do what we do but uh, and how it can just happen to anyone anywhere so this is out in the out in the burbs the southern burbs um, and I the more the more details I'm getting from and again secondhand but uh, basically and this is an older guy like I said past retirement age so not you know out looking for a fight kind of a guy uh, but he was in a it was a road rage thing I guess some guy was trying to cut him off or pull in front of him and he didn't let the person or something whatever it did is he ticked off the other guy the other guy threw something at his car hit his car with something so he stopped his car and got out well i don't know what transpired but within short order the other guy got out and clubbed him with something you know either a pipe or something but he got hit once or twice i said broke his jaw broke his orbital this is an older guy you know <laughs> this is not you know and this whoever you know this just a simple altercation but um it's just a reminder how you know those people are out there they're on the road uh and you've got to be ready you know and it was just a reminder to me is like you know as much as i practice and train things you know how often do i practice defending myself against being clubbed you know uh and think about that uh uh and you know so but anyways i'm just bringing it up as kind of a reminder of the reality of, of what's out there and the dangers even if you're in a i don't know if it was necessarily a safe neighborhood he was in but um, definitely not like the inner city or, or things that people think where well, they're going to not be safe. You know, you just be driving along and it just is not your day. So. Yeah. Age matters not, you know, and I've, I learned that when I was a kid that I, my grandmother and other old timers in the neighborhood getting mugged in a, you know, things like that and, and worse. Uh, so nobody cuts you slack. Now, obviously this wasn't a robbery. This was a road rage. And, and that again, doesn't, your age normally doesn't add, and these people are blind with rage. They don't care if you're older or, you know, it's sad. It's, it, but that's, it, it, that this is not a new phenomenon, all right? Um, it's been going on forever. And I think that's something that people 
especially the younger generation has to realize because of the internet and cable 24 hours nonstop, they, they got to put shit on because they run out of things to do or talk about. Um, this stuff is getting just reported more. Okay. I, I'm not convinced. And I'll bet you FBI crime statistics will back this up. I'm not convinced that it's a lot worse. It's if it may not even be worse. It's just reported more. However, shootings I think are going up. We just had a couple, what at the, the mall, uh, some mall over the weekend and uh, something happened in Pittsburgh at a party. Uh, but that's a whole different element. I don't want to get into that today. Uh, dealing with gunfire. One of these days we'll, we'll have a show dedicated to that, but yeah, you just always, you, you know, you just, I was always raised to, to know that everybody and everything can be a threat. So uh, you have to train accordingly. If you're a martial artist or call yourself a martial artist or an athlete in general, you have to have real world training. You, you just do, in my opinion. Otherwise, you know. Yeah, the other things that surprised me about this incident, well, it didn't completely surprise me, but, um, uh, you know, this the, the, the victim here must have been caught fairly unaware but was, or was not able to get, it was in the middle of the day too. I thought maybe, you know, I envisioned something maybe at night, maybe there's some drinking or the other thing is just being at night, maybe he didn't have the visibility to see that the guy had something in his hands, you know. Uh, you know, I don't know if it was a large object, you know, it doesn't have to be particularly large to cause that kind of damage. Um, you know, cause you might miss that someone's concealing something in their hand coming up to hit you with it. But just again, the, the kind of the distance management, keeping aware, you know, I, at least to get the hell out of there. You know, if you realize, oh, this guy's coming at me with something that, you know, get, get the car between you and him. I mean, I don't know. So what are you? Well, yeah. What are your thoughts? You have adrenaline. Okay. When you have those situations, sometimes what will end up happening is you be, you get seriously tunnel vision. Okay. Cause he was in a high stress situ situation and may not have just seen things. His mistake was getting out of the car. Okay. You, I'm not sitting here saying victim blaming, but you know what you, you, you have to learn things. All right. If you believe your, your car was hit by something, all he needed to do, get the guy's license plate. You got a cell phone now. Google the nearest police station. Drive your vehicle to the police station and get out at the police station and inspect your vehicle. And if need be, walk in and just make a report right then and there. But do not get out because he's your friend is lucky. Your friend is lucky he didn't get shot. Okay. So you have to use some common sense. Um, I mean, it's just the way it is, you know, you, you've got to try to have that home base. You know, I, I, we talked, I don't know if we talked about this on a podcast, but I know that I talked about this on, uh, when I used to do those Facebook videos and for anybody that's new to this, I have hundreds. I used to do a Facebook video every single day for like well over two years every day. So there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos on, uh, you know, like five, 10 minute videos. Um, but anyway, I used to talk about if you know your route, let's say you from home to work and you go through five different towns, you need to know exactly where all those police stations are. You need to know exactly where all the emergency rooms are in case, you know, you feel like you're having a medical emergency or if somebody's in your vehicle that are, that's having a medical emergency, you know, get to the nearest ER if possible. That's quicker than waiting for a paramedic. Um, you have to take some responsibility for all of this stuff. And this is so, I mean, there is no excuse not to know these things, especially now with, with the cell phone things, you can have it all programmed in your phone, you have all these emergency contact numbers. So your friend should not have gotten out of the vehicle unless the vehicle was un, no longer operable, right? Uh, it appears, it appears that his vehicle was operable. So um, get that license plate people. Or, you know, take a video while driving, because yes, I know you're not supposed to use a cell phone while, while driving, but that's almost a, an inadvertent way of flagging down a, a, a plainclothes cop. He'll see you with the thing. He'll pull you over to give you a ticket. That's what you want. Now you got your help. You know, you have the cop to say, look, I just filmed this guy. He just did, a, you know, he just did something to my car. 
and I'm trying to get it on record. So it's unfortunate though, that, that, you know, he got beat up over this, uh, but he who last laughs last laughs loudest. So he should have just said, okay, I got this guy's license plate. We'll track it down. Let the cops handle this. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, he, he was, I mean, he's lucky to be alive. You know, I mean, that guy could have kept on wailing on him, you know? Uh, yeah. And, uh, and like I said, I'm sure, I'm sure he completely underestimated what he was. And this is just a, re, like I said, I guess a reminder to everybody, don't underestimate the situation you're getting at. I'm sure he thought he was just going to get out and have a, have some words with the guy. You know, I don't know what he anticipated, honestly, but he's not a guy who, like I said, he's not someone who looked like he could physically take somebody necessarily. Like he must, unless he isn't, you know, like, I don't think he was looking for a fight or, or you know, he should have assumed he, even if it was, it was a fair quote unquote fair fight. He would have been it would have been a struggle against you know the majority of people out there you know most guys so he i don't know what he thought he was even if this was a fair fight but again he completely like you said it could, he, the guy could have pulled a gun on him you know and, and it, uh especially when these people are so irrational and crazy out there uh so um and clearly like i said he i don't know his arms weren't uh, another kind of observation is that his arms weren't damaged um you so know he like didn't his, attempt to block right right um and so yeah like i said he was either completely sucker punched by this or but whatever he was not ready for violence basically you know um and i, I kind of along those if if you're in a situation where you, you're right absolutely don't get out of the car but let's say you're in a situation where you're you, you're like somewhere else you're on the street uh what are your thoughts about defending against like a clubbing attack you know i think some conventional wisdom is, is obviously you've got to get in and kind of clinch the guy and tie up the arm, you know, bef before that swing happens. Yeah, well, it's again, you'll have people make a big federal case out of this and make all this big production, all these fancy techniques that won't work. Let's break it down to the, there's two things to do get, you know, block and tie, get close, or get out of the range. That's first and foremost. Okay, that it's no more complicated than that. It is really, truly, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's that simple. Then from there, you can make your choices, all right, uh, which is probably beyond the scope of this video today. If you were here at my, uh, my house, I could demonstrate some techniques um, to, you know, to disarm or at least to block. Uh, but yeah, it's really based along all of that. What's more important, though, is knowing your location. All right. It's it's difficult sometimes if you're traveling, you know, like on business and, you know, you don't know where you're at. Uh, but one thing. Many years ago, I, I went I did some police training in Cleveland. I think I mentioned this. And one of the instructors was a guy named Ralph Krieger, who used to be the sheriff of Cuyahoga County, which is the equivalent of like Cook County. And I think before that, he was either a I don't remember now, this was many years ago, 40 years ago, he was either an FBI agent or something like that. He was a federal, you know, he was a big, big shot. Um, and he used to say, one of the lessons was, if you were tailing somebody as a law enforcement officer undercover, and you get jammed up, all right, like, and he used the example of, of a neighborhood. Now, mind you, times have changed when he was undercover and doing this was in probably the 40s and 50s and maybe even into the 60s. But he said, you just pull up to a house, get out of the car and just walk up and walk in the front door. Because back then people didn't, you know, that's why I brought up the 40s and 50s. A lot of people didn't lock their doors. Just walk right in to save your, to save your hide. OK, now times are a little bit different. Uh, people normally don't keep their doors locked or open and you cannot count on anybody to help you. Um, but, you know, you still you should be aware of your surroundings. Uh, and and that's the thing. Whenever wherever I go. I look if I'm in a building, restaurant, bar, whatever it is, I look for 
entries and exits. I'm always looking for that. And then I'm looking for weapons. So if you're walking the streets and if you don't, and you don't have anything on you that you should, that you could carry as a weapon, you got to start looking around to see if there's weapons anywhere. Um, it's all about being prepared. We should actually do a video for sale, like a, a video series on just on how to be a, about awareness. Cause everybody uses that word awareness. It's like, be aware of your surroundings. Well, what does that mean? People don't understand really what does awareness mean. So we should actually do something on that. Yeah, it's important to have specifics, you know, because there's so much to be watching and looking at. It's like, well, what do you focus on? What are you checking out? Obviously, we talked a lot about like watching people's hands and seeing what they're what they're carrying in their hands as they, you know, as they get close to you in the distance. Um, that's one thing. Um, and like you're right, yeah, what can be picked up and used as a weapon is another thing. Well, I just saw a video clip I did over the weekend or like Friday or whatever it was, but I guess it's really recent. Some punk walked up to a 79, walked behind, snuck up on a 79 year old guy. And they saw it. It was surveillance camera. You can see the, the old man just barely able to walk, lit the guys, lit him on fire, lit the guy's shirt on fire. I mean, the guy survived. I guess he got injured, but they caught the kid. They, 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 he's a punk. I think he was like 29 years old. Um, you know, no reason. I saw the video. Did it and then took off running. Didn't try to rob him, didn't do anything. You know, so uh, it, it's almost like a thrill for some of these people, okay? So, yeah, there's so much to awareness, okay? It's like eat properly. Well, what does that mean? There's a lot of food to choose from. Well, there's a lot of awareness to look out for. There's a lot of things you have to look out for. Um, well, just the other day, you know that I was having some car issues. And I still am. I'm in the midst of another car pan pandemic over here. Uh, so I'm down on the ground out here in my driveway or whatever you want to call it. Here comes some guy now with a dog. And I he, he kept calling the dog. Come over, wherever the dog's name was, Butch. Come here, Butch. Come here, Butch. So immediately I'm, I'm not going to move. I drop what I'm doing with the car. And I'm keeping an eye out for this dog. So if the dog is going to come onto my, let's call it my property, meaning coming towards me, well, then I'm able to get up and I'm going to, you know, deal with it. I didn't get up. I was, cause I was laying, laying down cause I was underneath the front end of the car um, by the front bumper. I didn't want to make any quick moves cause I didn't want to startle the dog. Nothing happened. Dog took off. The guy took off no issues, but I was aware of that and stopped what I was doing. And my, 100% of my focus now was on that dog. And how am I going to, and the first thoughts in my mind was, and you know me, I love dogs more than anything. My first thought is if that dog comes at me, what is, I'm going to disable that dog. I have no choice. So you have to be prepared. Your awareness goes beyond human beings. You know, it could go, you got to be aware of, of anything. And another thing, I'm glad you brought this up. So since my car was broken down, I had to walk to the post office, no big deal. But as you know where I live and you know where the post office is, that's kind of like a that street that I have to go on is, you know, guys, they drive 40, 45 miles an hour, sometimes more. And there's no sidewalks, okay? I'm in the rural sh shit out here. So I was very aware of vehicles. And some vehicles moved all over, but no matter what, I moved even further over okay so i'm aware of vehicles because you just don't know and the thought was whenever a car was approaching i had to be completely focused on the car because if it started to veer towards me you you know on the road over here there's like wooded areas so my my plan was if that car is starting to veer i got to dash into the woods to get protection you know from you know by the trees because you just don't know. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things that involve awareness and no video, no school can cover all the possibilities. So what you have to be taught is critical thinking. That's the secret. I've mentioned this once before or many times before, people have to learn how to learn, okay? You have to train yourself and be exposed to tricks 
uh, techniques that will help you learn. And that means any subject, because and it, it really boils down to using critical thinking skills and 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 developing. You know, you got to trigger your mind to start thinking that way, not just to be lulled into a, you know, a security, false sense of security thing uh, or, um, you know, whatever. So we, we should we should get together offline one of these days and, uh, you know, discuss some projects that can focus on this. Uh, I think it would be very beneficial. Oh, absolutely. That sounds great. Um unrelated I, I you know we're, we're approaching our 80th episode for the podcast we're in the neighborhood of that so we've been doing this you know at the end of the summer it'll be close to two years or it will be two years at the end of the summer so that's pretty amazing so i was kind of doing an inventory of the episodes and we've had over 24 guests of different backgrounds so i thought that was pretty cool i mean really diverse group of people have been on this show i mean obviously we've had a couple of ufc fighters we've had you know different flavors of jujitsu uh, high level wrestlers of course but even more exotic stuff. I mean, we've had a uh, Salat expert, you know, Muay Thai instructors, um, you know, Wing Chun experts, people who know Tai Chi, Ninjitsu. It's, it's actually kind of been interesting to kind of inventory all the different people who've been on this show and, and, and discussed and talked their life. We've had those survival experts on here. Um, so it's, it's really been kind of interesting. I was, I was kind of proud of, of, of some of the content we've got. I actually went on, a, on your YouTube channel and took all the guest segments and made a playlist. So anybody who's out there who's, who follows us on, on YouTube, I've organized just the guest appearances onto a playlist specifically uh, for those. So if you want to check those out, uh, that would be pretty interesting. I'm going to look at other content too. I started to make one for ones when we focus mostly on self-defense. So I'm going to start because we have so many episodes now, a lot of stuff can kind of get lost. So we have a playlist for just nice. the pod, podcast episodes, but I want to also try and organize them based on our topics uh, when Thank I can. Thank you. So uh, yeah, for those who don't know, Joe, Joe handles the, the web channel and the, all the social media. I don't, I don't go to that stuff. Um, so I appreciate that. That's nice that you've done that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, when you think about it, when you put it in those terms and with, with the exception of a few, we haven't had any like real famous people because you don't need fame. Some, some, these are the types of people, the unsung heroes. Some of these guys were like phenomenal. And I still have people that I haven't even reached out to you know, real celebrities, you know, like actual, like, well, well-known guys that we, you know, um, that we would love to have on the, on the podcast as well. We didn't launch it originally with those kind of people because I wanted us to develop a following, uh, you know, like anything that I do, you know, it seems like my popularity 20 years ago was, I was the king of popularity. Now I'm like, you know, way at the bottom for, you know, because of, because of assholes out there, frankly, um, but I wanted to get a little bit of a following before we started having these high line guests on there. So maybe we can start reaching out starting in year two, you know, um, and, and start going for some of the big shots. Um, Cause that would be nice. Oh yeah, absolutely. And like, I, I think your point is exactly what I'm real proud of. It's fact is that, you know, you may not be a, you know, martial arts celebrity or, you know, one of the A-listers, but there's a lot of people who are doing a lot of great work out there. And, you know, I like that we're able to kind of archive their story and, and give them some publicity, you know, at whatever level, just so that it's out there and, and we've done that. And so I, I think that's kind of a, a proud accomplishment so far. Well, let's take this, for example. Now, we had my friend Scott Hall on a few weeks ago, uh, and Scott was trained by a legendary swimming coach named Don Watson from Hinsdale Central. And Don's in the Hall of Fames and all of that. And they actually did a, a book or a video on the Hinsdale swimming system or, or whatever it was called. And so people here are probably like, well, who the hell's Scott Hall and why should we care? Well, his coach, Don Watson, trained out of many, one legendary swimmer named John Kinsella. Okay. Now, for those of you who don't know, John Kinsella at one point was the world's greatest uh, marathon swimmer won all these professional titles but before all of that he was the first human being to swim 1500 meters in under 16 minutes he did it as a senior in high school at, at Hinsdale where Scott was and he won the he won the John Sol, uh, the uh, Sullivan award for uh, amateur athlete of the year as a senior 
He was in the 1968 Olympics, and I believe he won a, a, a silver medal. And he was in the 1972 Olympics with Mark Spitz and won a gold medal in the 200 re, uh, four by 200 med, uh, relay swim relay. Okay, so this is this is why I like having people that like Scott is not a celebrity, but you know we could have him back on, and I think it would be great for him to just talk about Don Watson, who's who passed away and can't speak for himself, but these are the types of people like Terry Dow. I want to have on here. I did. I used to work out with him, train him. And he's, I used to do seminars with him and Bill Wallace. He's Bill's number one student. He's going to, uh, uh, not accept. What do you call it? Uh, he's going to take over inherit. Uh, inherit inherit. Yeah. He's going to inherit Bill's system, you know, and I've been holding off to get Terry on, you know, we need to, I need to reach out to him and get him on the show. Uh, or get Bill Wallace. That would be super awesome. So sometimes it's super foot. Yeah. Yeah. All right, <laughs> super foot Wallace. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it would be, uh, it would be classic, but, but my point is I'm getting drift. Sometimes these people that you don't know of really bring the goods. And I can tell you not just in the fight game, but specifically music I've, I've seen and heard some, monster players that nobody ever heard of that that are working you know a day job but they're as good and better than most uh well-known musicians uh so yeah it it, it would it would be we got to we got to continue that and really emphasize these unknown so if anybody knows anybody or maybe it's you yourself that are watching or listening, reach out to Joe Cardinal on YouTube and just, you know, say, Hey, I'm such and such. And here's my background. I'd like to be a guest on the show and we can try to work around your schedule. Cause we don't like today we're filming Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, but sometimes we do it during the week. And if it's somebody from another part of the world, we have to, you know, work, you know, our, our time thing. But, um, Please reach out. That'd be great. Yeah, we've definitely had some guests who kind of, you know, once they heard some of the other guests are like, oh, well, hey, I do that too. And they've reached out to us and we've had them on. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the music analogy is perfect. And like I said, you know, you see that like in the rock realm too, there's a lot of great bands that are just local bands. They put out good music, but, you know, just because for whatever reasons, they haven't made it, you know? And, uh, you know, yeah, just because you're popular doesn't mean you're necessarily you know, the only thing that's good out there. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily, it's not a, a direct correlation popularity and, and yeah, almost everybody who, you know, who's in this or who's dedicated to something has an interesting story to tell. And it, yeah, it has for good conversation and, and people learn from it. You know, I think, you know, most of these things are, are very, I think the people who watch this podcast or listen to it, you know, uh, I think we give them a lot of uh, good information, you know, and, and like I said, I'm glad we're archiving these people's stories and hopefully to have some of them back. But yeah, I'm just real proud after kind of going through and art, uh, inventorying what we've done so far. It's been pretty cool. So, that makes me feel good, too, because, you know, sometimes I feel like giving up. Right. You know, we all do. And at times you, you, you just want to quit. But you got to look for little little inspirations. And this is one of them. One of the things that some of the guys that I train, the Tri-C guys, um, would tell me, oh, I like that podcast. And I thought they would have said, because I'll just use this as an example, because he's, you know, I, he's a Wing Chun expert. But no, they would be like, no, because he said something about his personal life. And I can relate to that. Right. Because many times when you're a uh, well-known, you're kind of, I don't know, one dimensional. Right. I mean, you're, you're like your whole life is, let's say, martial arts, right? That's all you do. And the majority of people can't do that, right? The majority of people don't, like, even if they have a martial arts school, they may have another job too, right? Unless they're super successful by teaching kids classes or something. But most of, most of the people have, you know, us guys, you know, it's normal guys. We have more well-rounded character we're not one dimensional and that's what i like about all of our guests unless i can't think of one right now everyone has not been one dimensional they, they they're very intriguing um their life story their backgrounds how they got in the training 
you know, their successes and their failures along the way. I think that's really cool. I think that's, you know, that's real. See, all of my coaches in any, anything I've ever learned were human beings first and foremost. One of the things I detest in some martial arts circles is this hero worship. Oh, you bow to the picture of some guy that's been dead. You know, this is bullshit. Okay. I don't do that shit. Um, I don't believe in that shit. All right. Um, the names, master, grandmaster, hanchi, sensei. I, 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 I don't like that shit. Okay. Everybody puts their pants on the same way. All right. Uh, so that's part of the martial arts that I never, never got into. Um, never respected that. I don't, I respected the, the, the talent, but this hero word, I don't know, even know what the word is. It's not even necessarily hero worship, but I, here's a funny thing. I told you about my Pac-Man. You, you saw where I, Mr. Heroes and it was owned by man Beck, him and his brother, his brother's name was moon Beck. Koreans, obviously, uh, they own, owned Ohio Black Belt Academy. You know, the funny thing now, Master Beck, you know, Man Beck was probably a grandmaster, right? I think he was an eighth degree black belt. And I saw a man all the time because I was hanging out at, at Pac-Man or at the Mr. Heroes playing Pac-Man and Frogger. Every chance, every free chance I had. I always called him man. I never called him grandmaster or sensei or whatever. You know, he never asked for that. And I never gave that to him. It wasn't even a thought. First time I met him, what's your name? My name is man. You know, so that was so cool because there was none of this, you know, bow to me kind of deal, you know, uh, and you can respect somebody without, you know, uh, this elevation that's, you know, probably not really warranted, you know, um, they're still just a man. So that's what I like about most of our guests or all of our guests. I can't think of anybody that came on here with this superiority attitude. They know shit that we don't know, but we know stuff that they don't know. So it all equals out, doesn't it? So like with this Terry Dow, we used to do these, I used to do these symposiums and he's still doing them. I can, you know, he wanted me out. I can't go because of my mom. I can't go for three, four days. But everybody's master this and grandmaster that and blah, 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 all these titles. And I'm Tony, not Mr. Cicchini, not, you know, I go by Tony or coach. You know, a lot of guys want to call me coach. That's fine because, you know, that's what I'm doing. But coach doesn't mean shit. Doesn't mean I'm better than you. So I think that's, that's really what I dig about. Our guests have been just average Joes, like no offense to you, but I average Joes, you know, and I liked it because you know, even, even Rodvan, Rodvan went by Rodvan. He went by his last name, Rodvan, King of Steel and Iron, you know, and all of that shit. It wasn't, you know, Mr. Rodvan or, I mean, at first it was, cause I, you know, but it's, it wasn't even, it wasn't Stanley, you know, it was Rodvan. Just like when I knew Luthez, which is what our topic today is. It was, he wanted to be called Lou. So, yeah, I guess we're segueing in. So, um, let's talk about Lou. Obviously, he's, you know, uh, a legend in catch wrestling. I think that that's maybe not even a big enough word for his, uh, his stature, you know, in the game. Uh, so, and I know you thought it was a huge honor. I mean, it's kind of, conversely, we were talking about people being regular guys, but you do pay respect to people who have really earned it and have done great things. Uh, it's a kind of dichotomy because you treat them like regular guys, but there's also this reverence for what they've done and who, what they've accomplished. Well, you keep talking because I'm going to go get something that I forgot to get. Keep talking. I'll be right back. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, and one thing I think it's Tony's had the privilege. I mean, it was right at that age where all those old timers were passing away. And I think it was kind of, I'm very excited to hear Tony's talking about his relationship with Lou and just talking about Lou uh, I think is going to be really important. I think we've, <laughs> I think hopefully people have stayed on the podcast long enough. I know we've talked about a few different topics already, but um, uh, it's a guy who definitely deserves, you know, at least a full uh, podcast uh, conversation with. And that, the one shame about it is, is that, you know, you know, he passed away, gosh, it's over 20 years now, right? That he's passed away. No, it's coming up on it. Yeah. Coming up on 20 years, but it, this would uh, obviously 
that would have been the holy grail getting him on something like this where we could have had a long form conversation recorded with him talking about his life uh but we're gonna have to do that kind of i think proxy through you you know you might i don't know if you're the foremost expert but you, you no. probably but probably the person who last years of his life was very close with him so well he respected me because of my actual submission knowledge you know the actual not the, the pro wrestling angle but the real deal stuff and um so yeah i first well i knew that we were doing a seminar at lehigh university and um and lou was going to be there which was you know pretty awesome in itself but i got to talk to him on the phone beforehand I don't remember if it was once or twice. And I remember just how kind, uh, fatherly, if you will, or grandfatherly, if you know, more appropriately, probably, because he was closer to my grandfather's age um, and knowledgeable. I, you can tell, well, I can tell, okay. Um, I want to segue before we get into Luthez. There was a brilliant singer and jazz guitarist named Frank Derone. Sadly, he passed away several years ago, but I knew Frank. He used to call my house and I went and saw him once. When I was on a date with somebody, some girl that I was dating at the time and he came over to talk. Now, he's a jazz guitarist, but, I, but he was mainly a singer, well-known. Matter of fact, Frank Sinatra at one point said he was the greatest jazz singer he ever heard. Um, and Frank, I asked him a question about Sub substitution chords, sub chords, right? And you know, he was like, "Yeah, you know, you you do a flat five substitute, and you can you can you can flavor the chords. Maybe add an eleventh. Maybe make it a uh, and and end the tune on a major, uh, like a major thirteenth chord as opposed to a dominant thirteenth. He's just talking shop. He didn't have the guitar; it was up on the bandstand. He's sitting at my table talking." technique uh a theory i'm like man this guy he needs to play more and sing less right because he really knew his shit that's what i get got when i talked to luthez on the phone okay obviously i'm not seeing techniques he's he's on a telephone but he knew he knew what he was talking about right and he knew it not from a pro wrestling spectator angle, which is what I was kind of thinking it was going to segue into. I thought he was going to start talking about that, but he didn't. <clears throat> he was talking off the record stuff, stuff that I've never seen him talk about in print. Okay. Which some of the stuff I'm not going to get into because it's not flattering to certain people, but I will tell you this. One of the things about Lou, <clears throat> he was, in an era <clears throat> that his coaches here in America, some of them were, or, well, all, all of his coaches were real deals. Okay. They, he wasn't trained like in a six week thing, like, you know, the AWA up in Minnesota, Vern Gagne, who was a legendary wrestler, by the way, uh, alternate on the 48 Olympic team, national champion, uh, collegiately NCAA national champ. But their wrestling thing was like six weeks, you know, and a lot of those schools were like that. Lou, these people took Lou, and it wasn't just one guy. It was, you know, a, a compendium of amazing uh, catch wrestlers, so legitimate uh, submission guys, okay? And that's unique, okay? It, it really is. And we're talking, and I don't want to leave names out because there may be other names, but, you know, guys like George Tragels, who, who won an AAU national championship, uh, Ad Santel, uh, real name Adolf Ernst, uh, 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 real, uh, see how I am with the names, uh, Ray Steele, whose real name was Pete Sauer, who was also a legitimate AAU national champion. Uh, all these guys are submission hookers, man. These guys were legit. And then, of course, Ed Strangler Lewis. Now, Lou said Ed was helped him a lot with his business career as well. How to how to you know financially and and stuff like that. Um, 
and Lou knew all the other ones, you know, back when it, in the era, it was still working matches, but there were guys, remnants of guys that were, were as real as it gets. You know, Lou met Joe Stecker when Stecker was in a sanitarium. Okay. And they worked out, they wrestled, they went, I guess, out in the grass. And he says, Stecker was just a son of a bitch. He was just so, oh man, he was like amazing. Right. He knew Earl Caddick. Uh, and there were other guys that he knew that he, for whatever reason, didn't get along with. Uh, the two big names were John Pesic and Toots Mont. Okay. Um, nobody's doubting Pesic and Mont as far as their skills. They were extraordinary. But I think they had a problem. Lou had a problem with them with the business aspect of it. You know, it wasn't the wrestling aspect of it. Because Toots Mott became a promoter. I never, I don't know what the situation was with, between Lou and John Pesson. So I can't, I, maybe I did know, but I don't remember. So I can't get into it. But when you're surrounding yourself with guys like that, or, you know, you know, they're part of your life. How do you fail? You know, you can't. When you, especially when he had his, his instructors there to you know pour their knowledge over him or into him you know surrogately but i gotta say he was really really nice just a nice nice man and you know he was on the lost art of hooking filming he came out there for the filming and they did an interview with him i have a clip of it on my website and uh, he, he, he had a tight schedule, so he couldn't be there for the video video. And he, I wanted him on it. He's like, oh, you're doing great. But there was one thing, one point, I forgot which Bruce would probably remember. Lou's like, hey, then in between scenes, Lou's like, show them to the step over toe hole with the cross face or something. I think that's what it was. I want, I want to see. I love it when you do that. You know, something complimentary. It was like, oh, man, I'm psyched. I, I, it was great to have, you know, just a, a, an amazing champion and champion in and out of the ring uh i can't say enough of that about him you know i can't brag enough well anyway before i get into the story about lehigh i'm sure you have a million questions so why don't you shoot away and well one thing that's impressive that he was able to hook up with all those instructors because you know at what point was he did he travel around? Did they have different gyms that, you know, are they from different areas or how okay. did that work? All right. So now again, I may be corrected by someone out there because you know, my memory loss, I believe Lou was actually born in Michigan somewhere, but he was pretty much a St. Louis guy. Now I don't want to call these guys instructors. It doesn't, it, you know, it's just the way it was, uh, but they weren't like have a school, you know, you, you were in a wrestling circuit and they were his trainers. George Tragos was living in St. Louis, and that's how he hooked up with Tragos. Um, I believe Ad Santel was in Frisco, San Francisco. I believe that when Lou went out west, that's he hooked up with him. Uh, I know that he became very tight with Ray Steele and lauded over Ray Steele, not just as a wrestler, but as a wild man, you know, just a, um, you know, uh, just a hell of a guy, right? And sadly, Ray died young. And then Ed Lewis, because Lewis was the most famous wrestler in the world, pro wrestler, and probably wrestler in general. Well, Gama, but Gama did works too. But Ed Lewis was really, really famous. And so they all took, you know, when Lou started hitting the road, you know, working out, you know, at different gyms, and they were impressed. And they saw something in Lou and decided, hey, this guy's the championship material, so let's – and back then, no, no, even though there were work matches, the majority of the champions could, could shoot. They, they knew how to wrestle. And if, if some of them were little subpar maybe, well, they had somebody there that was going to be their policeman. There was always a policeman. Ray Steele happened to be one. Rod Vaughn was one that would, you know, keep – uh, traders in line. Uh, and Lou just was uh, not only a natural athlete, 
I mean, you could look back at photos of him when he was young. He was always in shape. Okay. And when I knew him, he was still in shape, which that's one thing that you can't say about a lot of people. Lou stayed in shape. Uh, we were lifting weights together when he was like, what, 82? Um, shortly before he passed. The last time I saw him in Orlando at his fitness center in, his, uh, in the complex he was living. But he was just uh, probably the cliche. When we talk about me not liking cliches, but in the right place at the right time. And he showed his love for wrestling. It all started, I believe, he ordered at Farmer Burns Wrestling Course, which we knew was, I mean, Lou and I talked about it. The course was, you know, it wasn't really a course. It was just like a comic, not a comic book thing, but, you know, this is like to get kids involved. And it spurred him on. And he ended up, like I said, learning from all these champions, because you're not going to learn it from a Farmer Burns course. But. Oh, and he knew, uh, what's the other guy's name? Um, can't think of it right now, but another legendary champion that was older than Lou, or legendary wrestler, I don't know if he won a champion. Dusik, Rudy Dusik, maybe. Um, but anyhow, yeah, Lou knew them all. And he just loved to stay in shape. You know, he wasn't like, he lifted weights, but he wasn't a weightlifter type, like like a Bruno San Martino or, or, or something like that. Uh, a Milo Steinborn, he was just, let's, you know, and he boxed a little. He said he had some boxing training. And he talks about that on that interview that he did for me, or with, not for me, but uh, with me on the uh, Lost Art of Hooking that, you know, never got, I don't think it, I don't think it got released or it got released, but there was a problem with footage that he didn't have the rights to or something. I don't remember, but yeah, he was just a great, great guy. But Tragos was in St. Louis. That's how he hooked up with George Tragos. Did he wrestle like at a college level at all? Did he go to college? Yeah. All right. Yeah. No. 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 So like, did he wrestle in school at all? Like, so did he, was he like, I, and I don't know back then it was probably very different. Like probably people, I don't know if like you re there were obviously some who you, you mentioned earlier who had like AAU championships to their name before they, they went pro, but he didn't have that type of a career prior. I think he did amateur wrestling, but he didn't have any kind of uh, pedigree in, in, in that regard. Uh, but he was based on legitimate wrestling science. That's the key. And then when you throw in submissions, it kind of changes the game. Um, I'm of the firm belief that it's best to get somebody and start baking in those submissions right away. But submission wrestling, catch wrestling, not performance wrestling. Uh, it's very difficult to add it in afterwards because, all right, think of amateur wrestling, straight amateur now. Think about amateur wrestling as a uh, automobile and your destination, uh, you got a map to get to your destination. Now you take a catch wrestler, or, you know, the stuff that I do, you're, you're in a car, you got the same destination. You got the amateur wrestler and you got the, the submission, the catch wrestler, same destination. But the catch wrestler is going to take different paths, okay? They can't travel the same road because the, the amateur wrestler's whole goal in life is to either to win on points or to pin you. A real submission wrestler, a catch wrestler that's not doing performance really wants to submit you, okay? So to get to that submission... You got to take a different route. Okay. So the destination is to is victory between the amateur wrestler and, and, and a catch wrestler. The, the, the ultimate destination is victory. However, you've got to get to that victory in, in different ways. So um, you can't just, it's hard sometimes to alter an amateur wrestler who has years of experience it and and mentally has hit championship levels and that not wrongly but that you know creates an ego yes i'm a champion i i'm good at what i do rightfully so but now you got to backtrack and humble yourself and say no wait a minute now okay that's a whole different world than when you start adding in the hooks so it's not a simple procedure of adding shit in that's the problem. A lot of people do that. 
And they may have some success, but who are they having success, success against? Maybe the guys you're beating aren't really all that good. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. I don't know. I'm just talking broadly here, not talking specifically. I've seen a lot of videos through the years, and I haven't been impressed with most people, okay, as far as their, you know, their thing. So you've got to understand that you've, you've, it's easier to start from the very beginning, baking in the submissions and the rips and all of that jazz. Now, Lou wasn't a ripper, by the way. Lou wasn't all into that. Um, I was, in addition to the submissions. But Lou and I had different backgrounds. We had different, uh, uh, you know, directions to go. Mine was learning to, to, to save my life, to defend myself. His wasn't. His was uh, a job. It was. It was. It was to make a living. And that in itself is 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 different. To my knowledge, there's there's no video of him, and this is really unfortunate of him rolling live. Correct. I mean, like the only stuff I've been able to hunt down on YouTube stuff is obviously kind of the work match. It's stuff that was televised. For um, yeah, I mean, is there? Are you aware of anything that's out there that might be, no? No, I mean, you got to understand back then they, you know, I mean, maybe somebody had a home video, home movie, you know, video eight or whatever. I don't know what it was back in, in his day in his prime. I don't even think they had home movie cameras. They may have, I don't know, but I don't know how much they cost, but it isn't like today, you know, uh, sometimes you have to think about, it. even in my day, we didn't have, I didn't have a video camera. You shouldn't. You think my, my, my grandparents could afford that? No, we never had that. I didn't even have a camera. So it was rare that there was pictures of me. But no, I'm not aware of any anything, especially like when he was in his prime. Um, and that's unfortunate. But that's the case with a lot of people. Th matter of fact, here, Art talk about music. Art Tatum, everybody knows him, proclaimed as probably the greatest technical pianist of all time in the jazz idiom and rivaled classical musicians. There's very, very, very little footage of him actually playing there's audio recordings but I, I don't know how much video footage exists we're talking minutes all right there may be 20 15 minutes total of of, of him on 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 camera which which is a shame so when did so how old was lou do you know roughly about when he started going pro oh i thought it was shortly after I thought it was like shortly after high school, 17, 18, young. He was young. Maybe wow. right between that and 20, you know, was, he was young. And then like how long before he had, was they kind of decided to give him the championship? You know, how old he was when he got, that he got the championship? I, I, I wish you would have asked me this because I could have looked through my old notes. Um, but no, I don't recall that, but it was, he, he was, he was a champion at a relatively younger age. Uh, he held the title several times for, you know, quite a few years. Um, I really wasn't, and he, I think this is what he respected in me. I didn't give two shits about that. I cared about the real deal stuff, you know, um, like we, him and I almost got into a couple street fights uh, or whatever if you want to call <laughs> it street fights. We can talk about that later, but I only cared about the real stuff, you know, and we used to talk <clears throat> just life in general how's life going who you're seeing you know he's asking me that who am i dating and you know and i'm asking him about his wife charlie how's she doing but we would talk about techniques setups and stuff because i knew all the submissions you know there was nothing there but he would talk about i set it up this way or uh ray Steele used to do this or he showed me a hold down that ed lewis used to like to use um so like if, if the guy was getting frisky, trying to shoot on Ed, Ed would pin him down and hold him down just to kind of calm the guy down and say, you know, and whisper in his ear, if you don't straighten up, I'm hooking you right here in the middle of the ring. You know, that kind of shit. So those were, <laughs> those were things that I liked. <clears throat> That's what I wanted to focus on because performance wrestling, I mean, no offense, I knew some pro wrestlers. They were some of the nicest guys in the world. I shouldn't say I knew them, but I, I met them, you know. But that wasn't my thing, okay? I wanted, all I cared about was, was hooking. You know, let, let, I want to expand my knowledge on, on the real thing. I want to know some behind the scenes stuff about who really was a real shooter as opposed to one who was being 
uh, promoted as a shooter or whatever, because in, in the world of pro wrestling, the truth is uh, <laughs> it's kind of hard to pin down because it's a lot of bullshit. Um, so Lou told me, and there was nobody alive at that point that was, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> more of an expert on the history of American catch wrestling than, than Lou. He was the godfather. He was it. Okay. He was the man. Whatever Lou said, you know, carried all the weight. Uh, so that's what, that's really what I wanted to focus on with Lou. And then, um, and, we, and again, we would talk personal stuff. So you mentioned the ripping was one thing that he didn't do. That was part of the things that you were taught that were different. Were there other things where uh, your technique or approach differed? Well, I knew more submissions, a lot more submissions than Lou. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, th that's not a slight on Lou at all. Because once again, we had, we had a different reason to do things, okay? Um, Lou was a big time fan of the, of the double wrist lock, which was a, like, it's almost like a jab, you know, it was like a staple move, right? Um, he was good with his uh, toe holds and Achilles lock um, and uh, front face lock, you know, uh, neck crank. Uh, he didn't use it, he, didn't, he wasn't a big on that top wrist lock, which I was. Um, amongst other moves and but it was just because of a different uh end goal you know he didn't lou could throw down with the best of them i i can tell you because we used to watch some of the ufc fights together and you know lou would pick out stuff he's doing this wrong he's missing this blah 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 and you know so I knew right away because he was right. I'm like, yep, Lou knows the real the real stuff. But Lou, the problem with Lou is he was very humble about things. He used to say, I can't coach. He says, I'm 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 a doer, I'm not, I'm not a coach. Yet when he would show me something that he would like to use, he was wrong. He was a very good coach. He could explain things very well. He had a uni a unique way of doing the front face lock, um, which uh, is a little bit different than mine and very effective, highly effective. And it, and it stresses the neck in a different way. Kind of now on, on, when, when, what I'm getting at is the way he did it pretty much eliminated the choke, but cause they didn't choke really. I mean, he knew how to choke, but that was something. So it was a different, I can't show it. I can't do it obviously to myself, but, uh, so his was more a really a firm crank, a, a neck break in essence. Um, so he didn't give himself enough credit than, than he probably should have, but let's put it this way though. He knew how to lock up every limb. There wasn't a limb that he couldn't lock up. All right. That's what I want everybody to understand. And he did it succinctly, not flashy, not with all these exotic let's put it that way exotic moves um that you'll never pull off in a million years okay he focused now i'm not saying he didn't do some flamboyant stuff but some guys went way over the top you know with ridiculous stuff like you'll never see i don't think you'll ever find footage well maybe you could but he you know like a boston crab no forget that you know um uh, standing top wrist lock no he knows that that was all that was all bullshit now a half crab is a whole different story but the guy knew his thing and which what I thought was cool about him is he became very, uh, he, what was the word I was going to look for? Um, he had very intricate ways of getting into these submissions. So when you don't know a thousand, you know, where you can rely on this and that, and you're not ripping, you know, he, he had a more interesting approach to getting to these submission holes, which is what I, wanted to pick up i wanted to learn that stuff from him not the submission hold because i already knew him but his pathway let me see your directions give me your google map to that double wrist lock or to that inside toe hold or something that was what i wanted to get from from lou and i was able to 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 learn a lot of that stuff not the submissions themselves but the way to the submissions that's the secret 
And that's the thing that he was intrigued by me because I had different approaches to it. And we used to bounce ideas, you know, not ideas, but just back and forth, back and forth of, of things. It was just like two old ladies gabbing about how they make chicken soup. You know, uh, it was just wonderful experience. Well, that's awesome. It's a shame that those conversations weren't recorded, but that would have been uh, that would have been something. So, yeah, your point about him not being confident being a coach, I'm assuming that means he he didn't have fighters he trained. Not fighters. I know he was working with a very good pro wrestler. I forgot his name. Fleming, Mike, Mark Fleming. I, I don't want to disrespect the guy. I don't remember. His I've never I never had any interaction with him. I heard that he reached out to somebody. I'm not going to mention a name who wanted to get on my forum. And I didn't know about it until afterwards and until this guy said no. But I would have loved to have talked to him because they had a like a pro wrestling school. So I don't want to call that fighting. No offense to the pro wrestlers, but that wasn't like it was a performance school. I'm not sitting here saying that pro wrestlers can't fight. Let's not put words into my mouth. But the there was no this was before the UFC stuff. OK, um, so no, there. So I don't I don't want to use that term fighting. But that was later in Lou's life. That was not a. Um, when I you know, that was he wasn't doing anything when, 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 like that when I knew him. Yeah, I think that's a real the big shame. And obviously, you understand it's all business, right? That's where their bread and butter is at. So that's where their focus is going to be. But I think that that's why, you know, so much of catch wrestling is, is it's, I think a lot of people are confused about it. And I think a lot of the, you know, people's impressions of it are because that was never their goal. I think that's what was unique about your situation is that, you know, your coach had a specific goal for you and it had nothing to do with, you know, uh, any of the uh show business side of it it was he was trying to teach you to protect yourself or most other people were involved in it their ultimate end game like you said <laughs> is the goal victory or is it something else and in this case their goal was you know how do we make a successful business out of this how do we put butts in the seat yeah and you know it's kind of akin to um spinning back kicks and helicopter kicks like frank or john claude van damme does and all of that if they land they're going to knock you out but those are high risk, very dramatic, flamboyant moves. And sadly, I see some of these people that call themselves catch wrestlers trying to put off, pull off similar moves, not obviously kicking in, but, you know, wrestling equivalent of wild, fancy shit that, man, you might make it happen once in a hundred times, but boy, you put yourself at tremendous risk and you can't do that. And I remember Lou telling me, well, two guys that he couldn't stand was Antonio Rocca and Buddy Rogers. Okay. But he thought that Antonio Rocca really started with the ridiculousness. Now this is Lou's opinion with the jump kick, you know, the flying drop kicks and all that. There may have been guys doing that before, but that was Rocca's whole shtick, you know, and Rocca was in shape. I think he was a, he was actually Italian. They call him Argentina Rocca because his family moved to Argentina and I think he played soccer or something Foot, you know, they call it football. Um, so he had an athleticism about him. He had a nice shape, you know, built kind of like Lou really, but he uh, did that high flying barefoot, but he wasn't a wrestler. Okay. So Lou had this thing, man, you had to be a wrestler and not a showman. I mean, you could be a showman, but you got to be a wrestler. You can't be just a showman. And I think his his thing with Buddy Rogers was Buddy Rogers was in Lou's mind the first like big champion that just didn't wrestle. He wasn't a wrestler, you know. He was a complete performance guy, and you know that was probably the turning point uh, in wrestling where you kind of didn't have a lot of legitimacy left uh, when you have a champion that you know most drunks in the bar could beat the shit out of, you know, that's when you have a problem. Uh, so Lou was, I guess, like many or some old time, old time wrestlers, like, you know, he was still protective of the industry, but Lou came up at a time when, you know, there were a lot of legit some hard asses. Okay. Um, that new submissions and, you know, truly, could beat your ass using 
legitimate American catch wrestling techniques. Okay. And that's not the case anymore. So, uh, and I'm not saying that guys like, you know, that are in WWE or something aren't tough, but they're, it's a different thing. Like we talk about Haku. Haku has never been known as a submission guy. Haku, they always brag about him biting your ear off or your nose off or plucking your eyeballs out and shit like that. Okay. But in Lou's day, there were guys that could really go with the submissions, with the hooks. And th that's, and you know, Rod Von predated Lou and Rod Von was part of that shtick. When Rod Von came to America, he hooked up, as you know, with the guys that, you know, went back to Farmer Burns time. Um, but Lou was, I keep looking over here cause I'm going to show you something on camera when we get to it. Um, Lou had that going for him, which is something that I don't, I, nobody else alive can say, you know, he had, he, he, I mean, these guys were not just his coaches. They were mentors. They were personal friends. of his. That's just phenomenal. And how would they, so like in general, how would they, end up deciding on picking a champion was that like the, the again marketing you know lou was a good looking guy he was in shape and he was hungarian and i think he was german as well he spoke german um and that's important because there's a lot of ethnicity back then in america and he had that it's all about marketability do you have a following you know first of all you had to perform you had to be able to do what you needed to do and lou could wrestle Lou could fight. So he, he had that going for him. And he had the look. And he had the desire and the willingness to travel, you know, and probably most of it back then, way back then, was car, <laughs> you know, back in the, in the 30s or what have you, before air travel became more commonplace. And, you know, they would do the regional thing like, you know, Lou, uh, Bruno San Martino was big out in the East Coast, you know, New York and you know Pennsylvania because he was living in, you know, from Pittsburgh. I think he was from Italy, but, you know, living in Pittsburgh. So he had that East Coast thing going and Lou had his thing with the NWA, you know. Uh, so a lot of it is is truly about the, the marketability. And then some guys just weren't marketable. They may have not been big enough physically, like heavyweight. They may not have had the look. Yeah, like Ray Steele had all the ability in the world. May have been the greatest wrestler of submissions at that time. Overall, who knows? Uh, or Toots Mont. Mont got into promoting, but they don't. They didn't have Mont's an, actually an interesting character. Um, and I don't mean care. An interesting man. We owe a lot of pro wrestling today to Toots Matt, but he knew, he probably knew more submissions maybe than anybody back then at that point, but who knows? But the, the point is maybe they didn't have the look, okay? Frank Gotch, he may not have been the greatest wrestler of all time, by no means, but he had the look, okay? He came from heartland of America, Humboldt, Iowa, and he had the look. The All-American, you know, the... You know, so a lot of it is that, um, but that's, you still have to, especially back then, you still had to be able to do it. You could have all the looks in the world. Look at you. You know, you have all the looks in the world. That's why the women go nuts when they see you, but they go nuts because you can do it. Luke could do it. He could wrestle. He could defend the title if he had to. That was an important thing back then. So, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but you, you kind of allude to it with, Ray Steele, how good he was. So it's, you know, did Lou ever talk about who he thought was maybe better than him? Or was he, you know, I don't know if he got it like of his era being the champ. And again, I, I'm not trying to be negative here. It doesn't necessarily mean you were the best there. There was other right. factors in it. And so were there, so he <laughs> mentioned Ray Steele as being someone who was like also great or oh. yeah. Um, or I guess, yeah. So who else did he mention as far as like, these are the guys who, you know. Tragos, uh, Ad Santel, Ray Steele. Uh, you know, he. we don't talk about better, best, you know, this or that. It was like, man, they, this guy could do this. This guy could do that. 
the internet is what started all this. Who's, you know, in, at least in my life, who's the best, you know, because everybody wants to pin you down on something. What it amounts to in really, in, if you're a real fighter fighter, okay. Not, I don't mean like, I mean, you know, where there's going to be nobody to save your ass. There's going to be no points. There's not going to be a referee if you get in trouble, which is the case back then. And which is the case in my life with street scenarios or whatever. But you know, when, when you're shooting in the gym um, for real, not just like let's have fun, but with a purpose um, real fighters know that on any given day, something can go wrong. Okay. And it's a whole different thing than when you're training for a fight. Let's use the UFC or a boxing match. It doesn't matter. You have weeks or months to prepare for this. You show up in hopefully the best condition that you can be in. Whereas street fighting or gym shoots that turn, again, when I say a gym shoot, I'm talking about this isn't us getting a workout in. This is, I'm here to, 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 to hook you can happen just like this. You may not even be in your best condition. Okay. So that's a whole different element. <clears throat> and, and that's what a lot of sportsmen don't get. Okay. Like you could talk to a bodybuilder, bodybuilders get it. Okay. Cause bodybuilders don't walk around <clears throat> looking like they just stepped off the Mr. Mr. Olympia stage. Okay. That's when they're in their peak. See them when they're not in, you know, in their peak, whole different animal. So Lou had talked it's extensively about um, George Tragos, loved Ad Santel, and I think he was on the road for a while with Ray Steele. Steele was older than him. So Steele predated Lou. In, and they had a crossover, but Ray Steele was a uh, I, I'm going to use the name Ruffy Silverstein. Now I'm 90%. You know me what my, my names, I don't remember a lot of the names anymore, but Ruffy Silverstein was a legit guy and started to pull some shit, showed up at the gym. I don't know if it was, he was looking for Lou or whatever. I don't, he, unfortunately for Ruffy crossed paths with um, Ray Steele and Steele broke both of his ankles, not one. Toe hold one, got the other one to teach this guy who's boss. See, that's the kind that's I gravitate towards that shit. Ray Steele, who knows what kind of condition physically he was in, probably not the best. And yet his talent was there and his cohesiveness was there to, hey, I'm the policeman here. I'm the guy, I'm the judge, jury, and executioner. And as great as Ruffy, Sil Ruffy Silverstein was, and it may, if it wasn't him, it was another guy, and I can't think of his name, but this was a national champ that got taken out. So Lou had nothing but great stuff to say. And I've seen pictures, still photographs, naturally, of Steele doing a reverse heel hook. Uh, I've seen Clarence Eklund, who's from Australia, tying up in ground fight leg locks with Ad Santel. Um, so these people who today who may claim, oh, I invented this or that, that shit's been there. Okay. Now they, they may have come up with some novelty or some, uh, augmentation, but these holds were around. I mean, Lou knew exactly what a heel hook was. Lou knew exactly what a stop or toll hold was. So I can only imagine, um, the ability uh, when Lou was young to the, the, the ability that the, that Lou wanted to get from these guys, kind of like what me with Rodman, I was like awestruck. But when you're hanging around these guys that know all this stuff and how to manip manipulate a body like that, um, man, why would you pass up that opportunity to learn it? And you know what? A lot of guys did. A lot of guys didn't care about all that. They didn't want to spend the time to learn that toughen up. And a lot of these old timers didn't want to show the guys that cause they didn't have the, uh, the, uh, the inspiration to learn it. They just say, just, they're like, just get, let me hit my paycheck. Were there, do you have stories? Did Lou ever hook somebody? Oh yeah. 
<clears throat> oh yeah, I have, well, one story, I think he was in LA or California. He was at some nightclub <clears throat> and this upright, there was a band playing and there was this upright bassist. And for some reason he was heckling Lou. He was giving Lou a hard time. And Lou kept saying, stop, you know, knock it off. And the guy didn't. So Lou went after him and Lou got him in a double riz lock. And the manager or the owner of the, the nightclub was screaming at Lou, no, don't, don't break his arm. He's my bass player. I need him. So Lou immediately transitioned and went down and got him in the kill this lock and snapped the Achilles tendon. Because you can play the bass with a broken leg. You can't play, <laughs> play the bass with a broken arm. That is how Lou operated. That he, um, that was very thoughtful of him. But the, uh, <laughs> you thought so. Um, what about in the ring? Did he ever have to? Yes, he, uh, one, I don't know if I, I don't want to start dropping names, but one guy that's known for trying to act like a tough guy got hooked by Lou. He double crossed Lou in the ring and Lou ended up double wrist locking him and, and the guy submitted. Um, Lou was, there was countless episodes where Lou told me he had to watch this is a good question because he used to say especially when he traveled overseas you know different countries with foreign referees you had to be very careful of a double cross now let me explain what that means Lou carried the NWA title which was the only title that mattered back then we know these are works so let's get that up front but it doesn't matter uh, you could get double cross because you're giving your body willingly. Okay. We're just goofing around in essence. We're, we're performing here. And those performances at times involved giving a limb and you have to be very careful that the guy doesn't take it home. Okay. Or actually holds you down in a pinfall or that the referee doesn't do a quick count or just some shenanigans. So Lou always said when, if he didn't know who he was going against or he just felt something wasn't right, when he had to feed the guy a hold, he would always feed him near the ropes. So he could, so Lou could grab the rope if the guy was, you know, let's say he, he couldn't get out because once you let it go too far, you're in trouble. So he, he's grabbing the rope if he felt he was in any danger. So the referee would have to break uh, the hold, okay? And he would never feed the guy anything in the center of the ring if he didn't really know the guy. Because then, you know, the ropes are far. Uh, remind me the Danny Hodge story. I'll get to that. Um, please remind me on this show. Okay. Uh, sure. So that was something that Lou was always concerned with. And I was like that when I would give seminars because I'll let people, I used to let people demo on me. Lou's the one who told me don't do that anymore. You know, so I'm totally submissive here. I'm just going to let you put it on. And they could have taken it home just to make a name for themselves. Oh, I broke Tony's arm at a, at a seminar. Well, you didn't. You did, but you didn't because I gave you the hold. Okay. So these are things that you had to be very careful with. Because if Lou would have gotten seriously double crossed, now he loses the title. Even though we know this is a performance, but the whole everybody at that the auditorium or the stadium saw, you know, let's say Lou lose that title and he wasn't supposed to. So now what? Now you're no longer the champion. Now some schmuck in, you know, uh, you know, Timbuktu is, is, is proclaiming to be the legitimate world champ. So a lot of pressure there, man, a lot of pressure. So yeah, he was always on guard and yes, people had countless times, according to Lou, tried to uh, double cross him in the ring and he would let them now Lou was a professional. So Lou would wise the guy up most of the time. Sometimes he had to take him out right then and there, but many times he would just straighten him out, you know, put a move on him. And I'm going to tell you something else about that. Just to let him know, don't do that again. We have a show to put out. Okay. Now, one other thing that Lou said, this is interesting. When he was in the ring with a legitimate wrestler, and one name in particular that he brought up is Vern Gagne, he said, we would actually shoot. We'd shoot for like maybe four or five minutes, never to a finish, but we're going live. We're going for real. 
you know, so let's say if I'm just like, let's say Vern had him in a pinning position. I mean, he wasn't going to actually pin Lou. He'll eventually let him up. If Lou got him in a toe hold or a double wrist lock or a front face lock, you know, he's not going to finish the hold. He's going to let him go. And that was their way of staying sharp. Okay. Uh, you looked for that. You wanted to go up against the guy that you could trust that you knew wasn't going to double cross you. It didn't have to be every show that you did, but now and then just to keep your live performance skills up, you know, uh, so you can really, you know, that you can still shoot when you have to against champion level, you know, champion caliber guys. There's a lot of people who try to make a name for themselves shooting on slugs, guys that couldn't fight the way out of what paper bag. That doesn't prove shit. Okay. It's legitimately getting something on someone who's not a setup, you know, who uh, is, you know, someone who's expecting something. And if you can catch, catch somebody when they're expecting it, then you're good. But when you try to, you know, like throw a hook on somebody who's not expecting it, that's not impressive to me. You're a bully. You're a piece of shit. As far as I'm concerned, don't bully people, you know, don't be stretching guys that have no clue. Um, so that's what I liked about Lou and, you know, he was honest about it. Now that brings me, let me get the Danny Hodge story. Danny, you know, was phenomenal was God rest his soul. Lou loved Danny Hodge and Danny and him did a, they were working out in the ring. This is not performance. This is they're, they're shooting each other, you know, and Lou got him in the center of the ring at one point, And Lou got him in a step over toe hold. And Lou said, and he was grunting and everything. And he's crawling because he couldn't get out. And he's trying to hold on. And he's crawling to get to the ropes. And Lou said, Danny, those ropes are as far away as China. That's exactly <laughs> what Lou told him. And then Danny's like, all right, all right, you got me. So, yeah, because Lou didn't hook him. I mean, Lou, Lou could have sprawled on it, you know, and taken it home and blown out his knee. Yeah, you know, he's not going to do that. There was a friendly sparring match, but Lou got him, you know, um, which wow. was great. Yeah. That says something because Danny Hodge is incredible. Yeah. So that gives you an idea of the caliber you're dealing with if you could get a well, Lou was a, well, well, first of all, in, in Danny's defense, I mean, Danny wasn't a submission guy, um, but yeah, Danny, I mean, yeah, Lou, Lou, Lou could shoot. I mean, Lou. I don't know of anybody else. I mean, very few guys probably that ever lived are going to be able to do something to Danny Hodge like that. You know, um, I'm not saying he can't, you know, back then, you know, now it may be different now, who knows, but we'll never know. It's not, who cares, right? Let's put it that way. But Danny was a specimen, you know, um, like he had that grip like Rod Vaughn, probably not as good as Rod Vaughn. I was supposed to meet him one day with Lou and, in Iowa and he just couldn't show up. Something happened. It was a shame because I brought my grippers and I wanted to feel his handshake to compare it to, to Stanley's. And I know that he couldn't bend coins, but, um, but, but Danny had that legitimate amateur wrestling background that was at, at, at one point, second to none. Okay. He was really good. Um, but didn't have the submission knowledge. So that, you know, changes everything, mm -hmm. but Danny's strength could get him out of these other types of catch wrestling holds that just aren't, put on with the proper technique you can muscle out of it okay just like a lot of judo and jujitsu holds you can muscle out it's a string they talk about technique but if a guy can muscle out it, it really it boils down to you're using muscle you're using strength no matter what they try to sell you that it's all technique it's bullshit okay you know you've seen the difference because you've trained with me long enough you know the difference when it's real technique the strongest man in the world is not getting out of it okay um so, but Danny, a big regret in my life is that I didn't get a chance to meet him. Um, I, I wish I could have, because I wanted to talk to him about his, I don't you know about just things, you know, uh, more or less the boxing wrestling thing. Like I talked to Vern Gagne about that, uh, you know, about him going up against judo guys and things like that. And others, you know, like Billy Robinson and all of that. And, you know, Vern was another guy that was so nice. Now I don't, I only met him once. So I, I can't, we can't do a show on Vern because I don't really know anything about him, but Vern alluded to the fact that he would have loved to have had me on you know, part of his thing. You know, if I was 
old enough back then, you know. I never saw an AWA match living in Cleveland. We weren't part of that. But be that as, oh, here's another wrestler. Uh, Lou said the best mat wrestler, big, big guy, mat wrestler, the biggest, the best heavyweight mat wrestler he ever saw was Dick Hutton, who was a two-time NCAA champion. And he would have been the first three-time champion, but I believe Vern Gagne stopped that. Vern Gagne beat him. And back then you couldn't wrestle four years. So there was no four year, four, no, no chance of four year uh, thing in college. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah, that. Dick, yeah. Dick Hutton, according to Lou was the best big mat, big man, Matt wrestler. And um, he used to, yeah. Lou used to brag about him. Uh, and believe it or not, Lou used to brag about uh, gorgeous George, George Wagner. He said he could, he could wrestle. He wasn't a submission guy. But he said he could wrestle. But let, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the show, those guys. But anyway, getting back to the point, um, the only way you were going to beat Danny Hodge is by using legitimate catch wrestling moves, okay? There was a guy, and I don't, again, I hate with the names. It may have been Hiro Matsuda. It was somebody that paid Carl Gotch a bunch of money because he was going up against um, Danny. It was just in a shoot match. And I think it was like 10000 to learn all these hooks, right? All these submissions. Well, they didn't work. Because, the, I, again, I, it sounds like I'm besmirching people. Maybe I am. But they have a comment, I guess, because I've been besmirched for 25 years. But Danny Hodge blew through this guy, you know, like you blow through a damn uh, Kleenex tissue. It was over in a heartbeat, powering out, muscling out. I mean, there's a lot of people who can, can tell you that, yeah, these, these holes, they work against fish. They work against guys who are compliant. They're working against guys who are not expecting it. Um, but you, you know, to get a guy like Danny Hodge, to get a guy like Stanley Rodvon, um, that, that had, you know, that kind of immense strength, you, ha you had to have absolutely not one ounce of showmanship in you. You've got to learn to do those holds the way I show you guys how to do them with the twists and putting the person in an unnatural position. Otherwise you have no chance. You will not get that submission. It, it just won't happen. They will power out of it. Just like Bruno San Martino, when, when Antonio Inoki tried to shoot on him and put these submissions on, San Martino just powered right out of them. He's like, these don't work. He was able to get right out of the submissions. And again, Bruno's not a submission guy. He may have known a couple, you know, I'm not saying he didn't, you know, sure he could slap a choke and something else, but he was not a submission trained wrestler. He was, he was just damn strong and he was able to power out of all. Of them, okay. Because the holds themselves weren't highly effective. And I'll go to my grave saying that the shit that I see is not effective. They will work against people who are gassed out or not in shape or weaker or caught by complete surprise. But uh, there's another level. And that's the sad thing about my, my, my legacy. I hope when I die will be that Tony showed us the real, the highest level of catch wrestling, the legacy thing, the shit that's that Luthez knew that Rod, uh, well, Rod Von, but uh, Ray Steele and Tragos and Santel knew. That's what I want people to, to understand that this is what you're going to get through me. You know, we're not getting it from, you know, different sources. This is the lineage. And I hope it doesn't die out. Joe, I really hope it doesn't. Well, yeah, you and me both. Um, it's definitely part of our, like I said, our cultural legacy, and we need more guys doing it to keep it alive, for sure. Um, so you've been holding out on me. There's obviously something you want to show. Okay. The anticipation's been building. All right. So, yes. When we did the show or the uh, seminar in Lehigh, so Lou was selling um, photographs, which he had to do, uh, you know, just things and you know so everybody was like paying i think it was ten dollars for an autograph picture this or that well um well he ran out of photos so there was a few people that um couldn't get the photo but lou said okay well give me your name and address and when i get back i'll mail it to you so i don't know a week goes by i get this manila envelope from you know, dressed, okay, Luthez. So in it is this picture. Well, first of all, 
when I open it, the picture was upside down. So I pull it out and there's a, there's a, there's a $10 bill. Cause I gave Lou a $10 bill taped to the back of the picture. I get emotional just thinking about it. It was just, the, the, it was a wonderful thing. So you wouldn't accept any money from me is what I'm getting at. And he gave me this picture. I'm going to show it to you. And uh, it says to Tony C, welcome to our exclusive club of hookers. Your friend Luthez. And then the date is July 9th, 1990 or July 7th, 1998. And that's when, you know, I got the equivalent of my black belt, I guess you'd say, or the 10th degree black belt, uh, which was just the biggest honor outside of training with Stanley. Stanley wasn't into all of that. Stanley was a hard ass. This was the biggest honor of my, let's, all, let's say my, prof my professional career. And Lou told his wife that night, because it was a couple days seminar. He went, they went back to the motel room after they met me at saw my, my demonstration. And he told Charlie, he was so excited. He told Charlie, his wife, I just saw the ghost of Lou, of George Tragos. That's what he called me. You talk about an honor. It was an honor. The highlight of my life professionally was meeting him like that and being treated like that and those accolades. So nothing these, nothing that anybody can say can take that from me. The best of a born and raised American catch wrestler said that about me um, is the highlight of my life. Profe you know, it, it, it's, it's all it is. You know, it, it is no, no, no doubt about it. So uh, Lou was the best. In, in that regard, he was just a totally, he was a completely different person and personality than Stanley Rodvon. And Rodvon's purpose in life was completely different in my life then lose and Lou and I had a lot of plans, you know, but things happen, you know, he was older. I was going through some health issues and we were planning on doing a lot of seminars together and making more films, videos. Uh, as a matter of fact, Lou was trying to get me to, to coach over there in Japan um, and just everything, you know, passed away. It's a shame. What a good man. I, some of my guys met him. Brian and Eve met him. Uh, some guys talked to him on the telephone when they were at my house. I'd call Lou up, you know, and um, you never got to meet him or talk to him. That's unfortunate. You would have loved it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, would, I mean, yeah, it, yeah, it would have been huge. And I'm just, yeah, I can't be more happy or proud for you for that. That is, that is awesome. Yeah, no, um, all kidding aside, I can make a lot of jokes, but, you know, um, so <clears throat> I was staying at his, condo and Lou and his wife Charlie and I we go grocery shop because Lou wanted to make dinner that night so Charlie his wife and I were going up her and I like Lou's doing his thing so her and I walk off now I hear this commotion I hear this ruckus now you got to remember Lou's in his early 80s here these two punks now I'm probably uh Let's see, how old would I have been? Uh, this is like probably, I was like 38, maybe 37, 38. So I'm not old. Now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm full of piss and vinegar still. Well, these two punks literally started some shit with Lou in the grocery store. I don't know what they started, but Lou's ready to have at it. So I'm like, I go up, I go, I go running back over. And I'm like, Lou, let me take care of these two. Let me take care of the, these two clowns. He's like, hey. I don't need you to fight my, my battles. I can handle these two assholes myself. Lou, literally, at 80-something, was going to fight these two <laughs> punks. Cauliflower here and all that shit. These two guys turned their eyes. They didn't even pay attention to me. They just saw this old man getting ready for, you know, loaded for bear. Their eyes got this big, and they took off. I mean, they were gone. They didn't even, they left their groceries. They left the goddamn grocery store. <laughs> Unbelievable. And I, this, is, this is why I'll have an affinity for Lou forever. You know, he just wanted to throw down. He didn't care. No, he had a, he, there's, you know, I, I can tell you what he, you know, I can tell you this. He told me off the record. And again, I won't mention names, but it's, he was inferring to more than one human being here. He's like, you know, a lot of guys think they know holds, but 
let them come and get them. And that's the big knock. A lot of guys were, as Lou used to call them, demonstrators of holds. But they couldn't get the holds. And see, that's the thing. That's what he loved about me is that I wasn't a demonstrator. I could get the holds. You know, and, and that's why, you know, he, he, he's like, you can handle yourself against anybody. Uh, he was the same way, 80 some years old and he's still wanting to throw down. I hope that's me. I hope I live to be 80 something, but I, if I do, <clears throat> I know I'll probably mentally have the fighting spirit if I'm still cognitive, but I, I want to be able to still throw down. And Lou could have, Lou was doing reps with 200 pounds that day on the bench. Granted, it was a weight machine. It was a universal, but 200 was still 200. He was doing 10 reps. Wow. And he weighed 200. He's body weighting two ten. Uh, he's body weighting 10 reps on a universal machine. Come on. So, uh, you know, the guy was fantastic. And uh, he just, yeah, there was another incident that, that same weekend that involved me. I don't want to get into it, but yeah, nothing actually. And again, bunch of big mouths, blowhards, you stand up to these bullies, which is what they are, then, you know, they back down. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, and it's great to stand up to a bully when you know you could, you could flick them like this and end their life. That's what I liked about Lou. You know, he had that ability. Now, granted, I would never have let him fight these two guys, but just him like, you know, you got to understand, guys like this have their pride. And there was a time that Lou was probably the toughest man in, in his circle. I, you know, he's, he, he fought differently than, than Rod Vaughn. He was more fluid. Lou was faster, you know, because it's just the way it was. Rod Vaughn was more, you know, strength oriented, different approach. But um, one thing about Lou, and take this for what you want, but Lou said it right to my face. He says, I was the legitimate NW. I was a legitimate heavyweight champion of the world. Helio Gracie never challenged me. Because he was sick of that shit. You know, hearing all these challenges that Helio challenged this guy, that guy. He's like, these pro wrestlers that Helio Gracie worked with, they were, they were workers. They weren't even legitimate wrestlers. They were showmen. And, he, and, and, you know, and he's bragging that they went to a draw and shit like this against hacks. He's like, I was, I was a legitimate world champion. He didn't challenge me. I never heard of the guy, you know? So I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I believe you. So, um, yeah, Lou was just, so there was an edge to Lou. By the time I knew him, he was the Mr. Nice guy, you know, publicly he was all nice. And, you know, he was an older guy. He was, he didn't have nothing to prove anymore. But when he would let his hair down, yeah, he would say that, you know, he would still get salty and say, yeah, this, this guy, he tried to do some shit to me once. And I just, you know, I tied him up like a pretzel and believe me, I know German. I like pretzels, you know, that kind of shit, <laughs> you know, he was just unbelievable. Um, but I think he was more Hungarian than anything, but uh, he was just, again, just, honestly, a very nice guy. And um, I was supposed to go down to see him. He was getting inducted into the St. Louis hall of fame, some sports hall of fame thing. And Yogi Berra was going to be involved and in, in, inducted to maybe Joe Garagiola. These are baseball players. Um, but something, I don't remember now too, something happened and either he couldn't make it or he wasn't going to stay. Or it was something I, I didn't make the trip. Um, I wish I would have went to the couple other things with him, but our scheduling just, you know, it just didn't work out. But yeah, we, we spent, we spent some time together at different seminars and, he uh, he was at some jujitsu, some Brazilian jujitsu seminar from some with some Brazilian out in either Orlando or Virginia or something, and he called me on the cell phone or whatever, and he's like, "Oh man, this guy's a clown. You you know he I think he's just I don't even know if he's you know what he's claiming to be, but this is is this how they all are? I'm like, well I don't know because I never heard of the guy, but you know Lou's like, man, you know this stuff is so easy to counter whatever it was that he was showing. He he, he explained it. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And Lou was just like, oh, we got to show the world the real shit. You know, we got to show them. I wish we did. I wish we, I wish you, you know, he, he could have stuck around because things would have been different today. Believe me. I'm not saying nobody would be doing BJJ. BJJ is fine and it's got its place, but 
things would have come out differently. Oh, for sure. For sure. With I mean, no, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Absolutely. A guy with his reputation and background, uh, you know, you can't beat that endorsement. So, and yeah, it's uh, amazing. Well, thanks for sharing all these stories and getting in depth in it. I mean, is there any other stories or, or things you want to share about them or? I oh, know. well, I could keep on going, but it's Easter Sunday and I know you got things to do. We could always continue this at another, on another, uh, another episode. Maybe we should get Brian and Eve on because, you know, he could tell his, or Bruce, you know, Bruce was with him, you know, um, get, get their impressions of it. And, um, you know, but yeah, no, Lou, suffice to say that um, Lou was the, the chairman of the board. And a lot of people made a lot of claims after Lou's death. None of them dared make claims while Lou was alive because Lou would have put him, would have shut him up. Because remember, in the pro wrestling world, there's a lot of bullshit. And, you know, a lot of claims and just even stupid claims. You know, I, uh, I was born in, you know, Nigeria or whatever. And really, they were born in Detroit, Michigan or something, right? They just, but these, these, some of these guys were, would just make claims that, you know, weren't true. And Lou told me the truth about some guys, you know, like, oh, he was okay. You know, he wasn't, a, he didn't know submissions or he only knew a couple because they, back then they all knew the obligatory couple of submissions. Doesn't mean that they can actually get them on anybody. And it's probably their whole repertoire is three, three holes, you know, big deal. Um, but there was, let's see, there was, uh, we, sh we should end his segment on a positive note. I'm trying to think he was a big fan, of course, of Dan Gable. Uh, he just thought the world of Dan Gable and what, you know, what, a, what talent. And he used to say, you know, can you imagine, you know, if he knew what we know and how, you know, devastating he would be, and, you know, just so down to earth about it. And, and so uh, astute. Another thing he used to say, yeah, speaking of being astute, when he would travel, he would see other, other wrestlers, performance wrestlers now, um, they may have had an amateur background. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure certainly did from, from their culture, their cultural wrestling. And Lou said, you know, I could see him there. This move has potential, meaning potential to turn into something submission wise. Okay. And he would take it, make a mental picture of a mental note, go back home when he get back, get, get, got back to the States and try to work it out. Sometimes it didn't work out. Sometimes the move would, would not lead you where you wanted it to lead because that's the thing about holds. This is what people need to understand that sometimes you can have an idea and it could be a very, you think it's a very good idea. Then when you get to experiment and you see how the human body reacts, you're going to realize, okay, it's not going to take me where I wanted it to take me. All right. There's too many, the body will, will go in the wrong direction or you develop openings that you can't alleviate you can't close these openings so in essence the the hold fails but then there's others that will work into something now just because it works into something doesn't mean okay it's ready for youtube like these you know oh let me make a youtube video of it no now you have to test it you have to test it against a bunch of different bodies weight but more body style style of wrestling OK, because one wrestler may work on because his style is geared to this hole. He'll react in such a way that, OK, the hole's going to work. Against another wrestler, you may not be able to spring that trap. OK, that wrestler may react in a completely different way. And so the, the success ratio may not be there. OK, so this is something that I think a lot of people that's why I don't like YouTube. And many of our guests don't like YouTube either. Because people just, oh, I had some success in the gym. Let me show the world my new invention. Narcissists, um, when they don't put the time and effort uh, to experiment, and, and you have to do it over a larger, uh, just like in the medical field or anything, you know, there, there has to be a bigger pool to draw from to, to really see if this is going to work under fire. But Lou was always looking. He was always looking for the next thing which is something that everybody has to remember. You should never quit learning. You know, you should keep continue learning until the very end. And something that you may have been doing for a hundred years 
you may just all of a sudden have a, a light bulb go off or somebody may do something that triggers that light bulb and you're like, yeah, okay. And now I, can, I got an idea. I can go this way. So, I mean, like I said, when I knew Lou, he was in his late seventies when I first met him and he, he was excited to see my way of doing things. He didn't close the door. He didn't say, oh, well, I don't work. This guy, I'm twice his age. No, Lou, Lou, well, he wasn't like that, you know, which is, you know, thrilling. So from, for both of us, because, you know, I would throw my idea out. Sometimes he'd be like, oh, awesome. Or he'd be like, let me show you my way. And I'd be like, yeah, I like this. <laughs> I like your way. Can I use it? You know? um, and that's another thing. I did this on the Lost Start of Hooking. I gave credit. I remember mentioning Doug Bluebaugh, mentioning Luthez. You know, a lot of people don't do that now. They'll just say, oh, this is my move. It isn't. I always gave credit when I could, you know, to, okay, I saw, you know, Doug Bluebaugh did this or Joe Blow did this. I talk about Brian Deneve. Brian came up with the Brian Brain Buster, you know. Brian's move. I gave him the credit for it. Uh, people don't seem to do that. You know, uh, that kind of bothers me. It, it really does. It's just disrespect. It's totally disrespectful. But we're living in an age of a lot of disrespect. Sorry for my rant. And no. Luke looked good, too. <laughs> well, cool. No, this is a really good talk. Thanks for uh, let's delving into this. It was great picking your brain on uh, Lou and all those things. So I'm glad we got this down. And yeah, just one more thing I want to mention that we talked about it before, but Doug Bluebaugh was, was gold medalist in 60. And he told me that I think in 64 or 68, he was even better, but he got disqualified from the Olymp you know, the amateur, he lost his amateur status. He was a great man. He put me in his front headlock. Yeah. The, the guy was, you know, when he broke my finger, when he was, I, he was, uh, He's another guy that was just a giant on the mat and a giant off the mat. And in 60, he beat the world's greatest wrestler, Habibi, in, 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 in the Olympics. And, uh, you know, he was just uh, an awesome man. Uh, but, you know, I got sick in the hospital and I took time off. And then, you know, I never got back into it because by that time, things were changing and I started to have a bad taste in my mouth. Not towards these guys, but I just, you know, towards the whole thing in general. I'm like, I don't, I'm just going to keep to myself because there's just too many assholes out there that just, you know, are full of shit. And 20 years later, it's still the same. <laughs> it, it, it hasn't changed. So I, I gravitate towards the good people. And I can say this about getting back to our podcast. The people that we've had on, some of them I've known, some of them I never knew, never met. But and all of them have just been sincere and people that you want to have as a friend, people that you want to invite over to your house and have dinner with and, and extend your, your home to them. Okay. Stay as long as you'd like kind of thing. All of us need more people like that in our lives. You know, guys that you can talk shop with all day and yet still like them even more when you're not talking shop. And I think, the community at large, not just the martial arts world, but all of us in, in, in a community that are based on the internet, um, need peop more people like that in, in your life. Uh, believe me, because it's becoming a rarity. Yeah, we definitely have to uh, value those positive relationships and uh, maintain them whenever we can. I'll agree with that 100%. Well, I guess you want to wrap it up, so we will do that. But let me just close by telling everybody again, thank you for following us on YouTube, on, uh, YouTube or on uh, one of the uh, podcasting channels. Um, I may want run a little special. Uh, I should have done this. Oh, I can do this now because this is exactly what I'm going to do. And it's only going to be valid for one week. So today is, let's get this straight, April 17th, 2022. So I'm going to run a little podcast special until, let me look this up so we get this right, because people may be listening to this a year from now. April 24th, next Sunday, 2022. So if you've come this far, and listen to this podcast, 
I'm going to run a sale on my digital downloads, 30% off, and the sale uh, you got to put in the coupon code will be uh, in all small uh, all small letters podcast p o d c a s t. So even if you're not watching, you're listening. Seven days from today, uh, podcast thirty percent off my digital downloads. So let's see if we get any anybody jumping on that. Now that does not include that newest release because I don't have rights to that. As a matter of fact. I still haven't seen the video because I was never even given a copy of it. So I don't even know. So, but no, it's just stuff on my website. So take advantage of that. Buy one of my packages, uh, buy the tight, buy the, the complete catch wrestler downloads because you'll save yourself, you know, over $200 by using that uh, coupon code. I'd appreciate it. it. would certainly help me out and it will help you out because you'll get, get this. So don't advertise this, Joe. Don't put it in. I won't the, mention it. No, let's see. Let's it. This is for people who've gotten this far. <laughs> We should have put this disclaimer at the very beginning of the podcast. Anyway, it's just a thought that I had. But thank you, Joe, for always looking the way you look. Uh, you're the human statue, okay? You're, speaking of old timer, you should be in a museum somewhere in Egypt. As a matter of fact, if I get enough sales from this little podcast thing, I'll buy you a one-way ticket. Stand in a museum. Let them make a piece of art out of you. Just send me somewhere where there's no internet access so you can't reach me. That That's a deal. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> let me, I think internet's everywhere. Oh, I know one place where you probably don't have internet. I don't think you want to go there. It's a supermax prison in Colorado, but outside of that. But anyway, everybody, happy Easter from this lapsed Catholic 16-year altar boy um, that had has served more Easter Sunday masses than I can count. Um and with Radvan in, in, in the audience as well, in, in the pew, uh, I, I care about everybody out there. And if there's ever anything that I can do to help anybody, I'll try my best. And thank you, Joe. And we'll see you guys. All right. See you, Coach. <laughs>